guys, welcome to my channel. So today we will be learning the chapter number 7 of history that is civilizing the native and educating the nation. So let us get started with the chapter. So I'll get, so I'll get the information or introduction of this chapter. So when the British gained political power in India, their first aim was territorial conquest. Territorial conquest in the sense they have to control or they want to control the territory, the land, and then they have to uh, they want control over the Indian revenue. After they established themselves, they felt that they had to change the culture and tradition followed by Indians. They felt the Indians had to be civilized and educated so that they would be better. First, they want the territorial conquest and then they want the Indian revenue. Then they want to establish themselves uh, to change the culture and tradition. Okay, followed by Indians. And then they felt the Indians are not civilized at all. We should civilize them by giving some knowledge and etc. etc. And lastly, the East India Company wielded the power over Indian territory from 1612 to 1868. By, uh, uh, there are multiple ways like by setting the industry, then using uh, some raw materials from farmers, etc. etc. India came under the direct rule of British monarchs from 1858 to 1949. India gained independence in 19. The Indians reacted sharply to the introduction of new ideas in the field of education. Many Indian leaders had their own ideas of how to improve the education among the Indians. So Indians were illiterate and uncivilized. So they have to educate them. Then they, st uh, then they started establishing or sorry, introducing the new laws rules for Indians. Who was William Jones? William Jones. Sir William Jones was an Anglo-Welsh philologist and a scholar of ancient India, particularly known for his proposition of existence of relationship among the Indo-European language. William Jones was none other than the linguist with his ancient and NCRT book. He was a linguist he was having a great attitude towards India. He came to India and he established the good relationship between Europe and India. He knew many languages, for example, Greek, Latin, English, Persian and Arabic. Even he learned Sanskrit from the Indian princes. What was William Jones' view? In 1783, William Jones came to India as a junior judge to work in the Supreme Court set up by East India Company. In addition to being a lawyer, Jones was a linguist. He knew many languages as Greek, Latin, French, English, Arabic and Persian. He had a deep passion to learn many more languages. He spent many hours with pandits who taught him Sanskrit language, grammar, and poetry. He started studying ancient Indian books on law, philosophy, religion, politics, morality, arithmetic, medicine, and the other sciences. But why? Why is he was willing to learn this ancient? politics, morality, atomic law, psychology, whatever, philosophy and all or not. Because he wanted to express his attitude towards India. To mix with Indian people, to know about this country, he should know that. As he was having interest to know about it. He discovered that his interests were shared by many British officials living in Calcutta at that time. Englishmen like Henry Thomas and Colebrook Henry Thomas Colebrook and Nathaniel Hallhead Hall Hall were also busy discovering the ancient Indian heritage, mastering Indian language and translating Sanskrit and Persian into English. This William Jones was an Orientalist, but these Henry, uh, Henry Colebrook and Nathaniel Hallhead Hall was 
were not the foreign ones. They were just some British officers, but they don't want to really change the Indian customs and all. Henry Thomas Fulbrook and the Asiatic Society. He was a scholar of Sanskrit and initial sacred writing of Hinduism. Jung, Henry Thomas Fulbrook and Nathaniel Howard set up an Asiatic society. These three people set up Asiatic society. Henry Thomas Colbrook, this Nathaniel Hallhead, and William Jones set up an Asiatic society of Bengal. Okay, and also started a journal called Asiatic Research. The Asiatic Society of Bengal was founded by renowned English jurist Sir William Jones. Asian languages, literature, arts, and sciences to the attention of Europeans. The member of the Asiatic Society of Bengal were the first European scholars to recognize the common ancestry of Sanskrit with Greek, Latin, and other European languages. They considered Sanskrit as the classical language of Indians and praised its wonderful structure and stated that it was more perfect than Greek. So, this is the Asiatic Society of Bengal. Okay, and this was the journal which was started by these three people. Okay. Jones and Colbrook came to represent a particular attitude towards India. So, William Jones and Henry Thomas Colbrook came to India to represent a particular attitude towards it. They shared a deep respect to ancient cultures, okay, both of Indian and the West. India had a glorious past and to understand this, one had to read the sacred books that were written during the ancient time. These ancient books reveals the real image, real ideas and laws of the Hindus and Muslims. One had to understand these books to chart out the basic future development of India. So they wrote some books, they were orientalists, they want to express their attitude towards India. They have interest in learning the culture, religion and etc. etc. Even these two um, people discover ancient books, they understand their meaning, studied Vedas, translated them, make their findings to, the, to be known to others. On company officials. Jones and Colbrook were Orientalists. Okay? Jones and Colbrook felt that their findings would not only help people learn from Indians, but it would also help Indians rediscover their own heritage and understand the lost glories of their lost glories of their past. Their findings will also establish the British as guardians of Indian culture and gain total control. Many officials of India, East India Company, who were influenced by findings of Jones and Colbrook, wanted to promote Indian rather than Western learning. Yeah, mainly were towards Indian, Indian uh, civilization. Many people turned towards it because they thought like, yeah, it is having some value. Therefore, instead of promoting the Western learning, they promoted Indian. Okay. They felt that institutions should to, uh, should be set up to encourage the study of ancient Indian texts and teach Sanskrit and Persian to the people. To promote Indian learning in India, the British hope to win a place in heart of India towards native Indians okay, by teaching them the languages that were familiar with. In 1781, the Madrasa was set. Madrasa is a place where a Madrasa was set in Calcutta to promote Arabic, Persian, and Islamic law. Madrasa is a place for Muslims where Muslims learn about Islamic law, Bible, Arabic, and Persian languages, which are their, which is their own language. So Madrasa is basically for Muslims. And uh, it was set up in 1781. Okay, in Calcutta. And in 1981, the Hindu College was established in Banaras. So in Banaras, Hindu College was established for Hindus specially to 
learn ancient Sanskrit texts. Okay, and I made this lesson with you, and uh, it would be easy for them to identify some Sanskrit by establishing corridors according to the two caste right and i also as you know um this british uh, started the policy of dividing the empire so they they, uh, they started fighting between two castes and so they got a big behavior okay british officials criticized the orientalists as william jones and Goethe for their criticism they were they were being criticized by british officials though there was one group that was opinion uh, was of was the opinion that indian culture and tradition should be promoted there was also another group that british officials criticized the orientalist mission of learning they felt that it was wrong on the part of british to spend so much effort in encouraging the study of arabic for as sanskrit languages and literature according to this group knowledge of the east was full of errors and unscientific so east uh, western people were saying like no this uh, knowledge of the east was full of errors okay and it is unscientific we should not listen to them so even british officials cross a uh, criticized the orientalist even they supported the west and uh, eastern literature was not that serious and light hearted james mill was not trying to attack the orientalist so james mill was the one who attacked, attacked Orientalism. Alright, he declared that the British should not take what Native Indians wanted and respect it, just make a place in their hearts. So all Native Indians should be, they should know about practical things, knowledge and all. This, this James Mill said that um, as an Orientalist was having great interest to learn the culture and all, he said no, you should learn about the culture, you should think about the sentiment of the people. Instead, we will teach them the practical knowledge uh, which is necessary. Okay. James Mill said that Indians should be made understand the scientific and technical advances that were that progress. He said learning poetry was not necessary. In 1830s, the attack on the Orientalists increased. One of the most outspoken and influential of such criticized time was Thomas Babbin. Macaulay. Thomas Babington Macaulay. Who was he? He was one of the most criticizer of Orientalism. This Thomas Bab Babington Macaulay was the 19th century British poet and historian. He wrote extensively on British history. He was appointed as the first law member of Governor General's Council. He served in India on the Supreme Court. Uh, Council of India between 1834 and 1838. He was instrumental in creating the foundations of Bengal colonial India. Colonial India. By convincing the Governor General to adopt English as the medium of instruction in higher education from the year of schooling. So he introduced the uh, the education in english language what was the macaulay's point of view macaulay said that macaulay said that india as an uncivilized country that needed to be civilized he felt that no branch of eastern knowledge could be compared what england has produced shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. He owes that British government in India stop wasting public money in promoting Oriental learning, for it was of no practical use. He emphasized the need to teach the English language. English Education Act of 1835 this Macaulay started the act of English education in year 1835. The knowledge of English would make them aware and development in Western and science and philosophy, he thought. Teaching of English could thus be a way of enlightening the people.
of India, changing their tastes, values, and cultures, following Michaelis' view, views in the English Education Act of 1835. This question might come, which, sorry, when was the English Education Act established? Okay, so answer will be in 1835. 1835. The main features of English Education Act of 1835. English was made the medium of instruction, promotion of Oriental institutions like Calcutta, Madrasa, Benares, Sanskrit, colleges were stopped. English textbooks were produced for the schools. Education for commerce. In 1854, the Court of Directors of East India Company in London sent an educational dispatch to the Governor General in India. It was issued by Charles Wood, the President of Board of Control of Company. He was known as it was known as Wood's Dispatch. So the question might come, what is Wood's Dispatch? Wood's Dispatch is nothing but the... But in 1854, the Court of Directors of East India Company in London sent an educational dispatch to Governor General, which was issued by Charles Wood. And in that, it was written, like, uh, Indians should be taught commerce, how to trade these things. So this is Wood's dispatch. As the president of Board of Control, Charles Wood did a great job in spreading education in India about commerce. In 1854, he sent dispatch to Dalhousie, the, the, the then Governor General of India. The Wood's dispatch recommended that an, an education department was to be set in every provision Universities on the model of London University be established in big cities such as Bombay, Kolkata and Madras. At least one government school be opened in every district. Affiliated private school should be given grant in aid. The Indian natives should be given training in their local languages. So, this uh, what, what did Charles would say? He said, what was Wood's dispatch? He said, like, education should be in every provision. There should be uh, at least one government school in each and every district. It should be affiliated to private schools and should be granted in aid. Established in, uh, first of all, they, are, they were established in a big countries. Sorry, big places, big cities as Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. The advantages of Woods Dispatch for the British in India. The Woods Dispatch stated that learning English will be advantage for Indians and great. Therefore, the British also had an ulterior motive to promote English education and English culture. Introducing them to the European way of life would change their tests, desires and create the demand, of, demand for British goods among the Indians. European learning would improve the moral character of Indians. It would make them truthful and honest and thus supply the company with civil servants. They thought when these people will learn an English, they might be helpful for us or they would be helpful for us as we can make them as servants as they will, they will learn English and they, can, they will be loyal towards them or else they will do any work whichever is assigned to them. In accordance with Wood's dispatch, education departments were established in every provision and universities were opened at Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. In 1857 and in Punjab in 1882 at an Allahabad 1871. So these were these are the places where um, education place were set up. Attempts were also made to bring about changes within the system of English education or Indian education. So this is Bombay University. This is Calcutta huh? University. This is Madras University. This is Allahabad University. So actually this was a Bombay University but now it is not. It is the Municipal Corporation of Bombay. William Carey. So William Carey was a British machinery a uh, particular Baptist, ba 
Baptist, Baptist minister, a translator, and an activist. He also opened the first university in Serampore, offering degrees. He is known as father of modern mission. So this question would come, like, of who was William Carey and what did he did? So William Carey was none other than the British missionary, okay, Baptist minister. He was a translator, activist, and a Okay. He also opened the first university in Serampore, offering degrees to the people, and he is known as the father of modern mission. Mission. He was born on 17th August, 1761. Okay, in the United Kingdom, you came died on 9 June 1834 in Serampore. His spouse was Grace Hughes. So his spouse was Grace Hughes. Okay, and uh, just this much is going to be going on with him. All right. This is his home, William Adams. William Adams was um, known as the Japanese as Mira Ajin and was an English navigator who in 16 was as Mira Ajin was an English navigator who in 16 and 1600 was the first of his notion to reach Japan. He was born on September 24, 1564. Gilgham, United Kingdom, died on 16th May 1620. So, this was about um, William Adams and William Udo Nagasaki in Japan. William Adams report. What did he do as a predecessor? William Adams report gives us an insight into education system that was prevalent in India before the British established political power in India. The English East India Company had asked William Adams, a Scottish missionary, to provide reports about the local schools of Bengal and Bihar. Then Adam toured, toured the two states extensively in, 30, in 1830. So the report states, over one lakh Pachalas existed, existed in Bengal and Bihar. Twen uh, Pachalas were small institutions with no more than 20 students each. The total number of children being taught in these Pachalas were over 20 lakhs. These Pachalas were set up by wealthy people or local community. Some Pachalas were started by a teacher or guru. The system of education was flexible. There were no fixed fee, no printed books, no separations, no separate school, no benches or chairs, no blackboard, no system of separation, separate classes, no attendance register, no annual examination, no regular timetable as well. In some places, classes were held under a banyan tree. In other places, in the corner of village, shop or temple or at village home. Fee depended on the income of parents. The rich had to pay more than poor. Teaching was oral and gurus decided what to teach in accordance to the need of students. Students were also not separated into different groups or classes. All of them sat together in one place. The guru interacted separately with groups of children with different levels of learning. William Adam founded that flexible system was suited to local need. Classes were not held during the harvest time when ruler children worked in the field. The Pachala started once when the crop has been cooked. New routines and new rules. Then uh, the Britishers thought that no, this is not correct way of education. Therefore, they introduced some new routines and rules. In the beginning of company was concerned with primarily with primarily with higher education. The local Pachalas function as usual. After 1854, the company decided to improve the system of vernacular vernacular education. Rules were imposed, routines were established, regular inspections were held, changes that were introduced in the Pachalas. So, uh, government pandits were appointed as a teacher. Each pandit was in charge of four to five schools. The pandit visited the, the pandit visited the Pachalas and tried to improve the standard of education teaching. Each guru or teacher in the Pachalas asked 
to submit the periodic reports and take tests according to the regular timetable. Teaching was now on the uh, based on textbook and learning according to distal through a system of annual examination. Students were asked to pay a regular amount of fee, a regular fee, attend regular classes, sit on fixed benches or seats, obey the new rules and discipline. Parchalas which accepted the new rules were supported through government grants. Those who were unwilling to work within the new system, they were not being supported by the government. Some consequences of changes that were introduced. So the, there were uh, negative consequences. Parchalas that wanted to retain their old method of teaching found it difficult to compete Pachalas that changed and received the government grant. Peasants' children who were able to study in old Pachalas because of flexible timetables found it difficult to attend new schools. Even the lack of education or lack of interest in studying was seen in the, amongst the children. The agenda of national education. From the early 19th century, many Indian scholars also felt the need for development in the field of education. Some Indians felt that Western education would help modernize India. They urged the British to open more schools, colleges and universities and spend more time on education. Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore were against Western education. So, this Britishers, what did they do? They said, like, um, Western education is more convenient. But Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore didn't accept that. Gandhi wants what type of education? Mahatma Gandhi felt that coli colonial education created a sense of inferiority in the minds of Indians. It made them see Western civilization as superior and destroyed the pride they were in their own culture. Indian's education educated in these institutes welcomed everything that came from the West and started admiring British rule. Mahatma Gandhi was keen on an education that could help Indians recover their sense of dignity and self-respect. He motivated the students to leave educational institutes and start educational institutions established by British to show them that they were not they did not want to be enslaved more. Mahatma Gandhi wanted one's mother tongue to be the medium of teaching. Gandhi felt that education English education made Indians strangers in their own land. He felt that Western education was more textual than the practical means he was totally criticizing the education education according to gandhi was not only knowing and knowing how to read and how to write it was not for developing the mind and soul okay gandhi she felt that children have to learn practically with their hands they need to learn how to operate different types of things this would develop their mind and their capacity to understand. As a nationalist movement gathered in momentum, many leaders started thinking about Gandhiji's view on education. They realized that other uh, other uh, realized the need they, rea they realized the need need for a system of national education which would be totally different from set up by the British. So Rabindranath Tagore. Classrooms under Shanti Niketan. Uh, this Rabindranath Tagore was also the criticizer of edu education of the uh, West, but he did not criticize totally. Okay, Rabindranath Tagore started an open air school for the children named Pat Bhavan. Tagore's idea was that learning in natural environment in the open under trees would be closer to nature. After Tagore received the Nobel Prize in 1913 for literature for his book Gitanjali, he wrote one book known as Gitanjali. Okay, Gitanjali. The school was expanded into university and named Viswa Bharti. Viswa Bharti, Bharti. Tagore's idea of education. Tagore felt that childhood ought to be time of self learning. Today, Vishwa Bharti is one of the renowned universities which attract thousands of students each year. 
Shantaniketan is also a tourist attraction because Rabindran Tagore many of his legacy class, classics here. First woman Prime Minister of India Indira Gandhi renounced film director Satyajit Ray and Nobel laureate Amritya Sen. Amritya Sen are among these most illustrious students. Outside the rigid and restricting discipline of the school system set up by British. Teachers had to be imaginative, understand the child, and help the child to develop the curiosity. The natural desire, the natural desire of the child is to be creative, it should be encouraged. Tiger felt that creative learning could be encouraged only within a natural environment. Living in harmony with nature, child, children could cultivate their own creativity. Gandhi and Tagore. Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi had the same concept of education. The only difference was Gandhi was highly critical of Western education and its um, worship of machines and technology. But Tagore wanted to combine the elements of modern Western civilization which he saw as the best with Indian tradition. He emphasized that the need of teaching of English and technology at Chantanikita along with art, music, dance and practical skills. As, a, as, the British brought drastic, as the British brought drastic changes the Indian system of education, many Indian scholars started thinking about national education system and also they were passionate about it. Some wanted changes with the system set by British but others were alternative the system to the created. They know they, uh, they, they urged Britishers to set up more colleges and all, but some criticize this. The debate on national education continued even after it. So, hope you guys understood about this chapter. It was really very interesting chapter. In this we learn how the Britishers were thinking to civilize the uncivilized people of India and how they, how they want the education. And we also learn about the things that uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore said about British education. So, hope you like this video. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe my channel.